Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marianne Yoshioka, and I am the chair of the 2018 Otelia Cromwell Day Planning Committee, and I am also the dean of the Smith College School for Social Work. Otelia Cromwell Day is an important moment, maybe more so in these times as acts of racialized violence and injustice abound. Every day, we bear witness to harm, erasure, and disrespect to people and communities of color, Jewish people and communities, people who identify as transgender and non-binary, and migrant families. Racism and oppression in the times of Otelia Cromwell have differences from today, but unfortunately have many commonalities, because at the heart of it, are structures and systems of white supremacy that seek to devalue the humanity and worth of black people in particular and people of color and queer folks overall. And this is why Otelia Cromwell Day is important. Dr. Cromwell's legacy is a call. It's a call for each of us and for this college to continuously commit to learning about, disrupting and repairing from the ways that our social structures and systems recreate oppression and award differential privilege and power. Even at a place like Smith, where we actively do not want to perpetrate racism and oppression, it happens because that is how our lar larger social system is meant to work. But it is also important to never lose sight of the fact that we also have here all the ingredients to create and bring greater justice to this campus for the communities that we come from and those that we will serve. Dr. Cromwell has given us a vivid example that justice can prevail and we can bring change. This is what Otelia Cromwell Day means to me, a commitment to social justice and on behalf of our planning committee, I ask that each of us take a moment in honor of Dr. Cromwell to recommit to staying engaged, to learn about the insidious, pernicious way that racism and structural oppression manifest, all the ways that it harms people, particularly black communities, and to finding the ways that each of us, individually, in our roles, and collectively, can change systems, not through hate, but through love and compassion and by being a voice for justice. This plenary is just the beginning of an afternoon that we hope you will find invigorating, instructive, and restorative. I want to thank everyone on the planning committee, the Otelia Cromwell Day Advisory Group, to those performing at this plenary, and all those who have given their time to make this week possible, our workshop presenters, all those who have prepared the rooms, made the food, delivered the materials, and seen to the details. In particular, I want to acknowledge Kim Alston in the Center for Religious and Spiritual Life, Queen Lanier in the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, Sam Miss Center in College Relations, and Kai Shirley, an extraordinary student of Smith Student Body, class of 2018. It is now my pleasure to welcome Black Capella to the stage. They will be releasing a short video about the history of their group in the upcoming week, so please look out for that. Please welcome Ava Dujon, Allison Daniels, Olivia Baldwin, Chanel White, Amirchi Okorum, Julie Destine, Desiree Michelle, Joyanne Joseph, Rosie Poku. They will lead us in the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Can we all stand? Thank you. I think so. <laughs> no, we're not gonna go. Switch me, switch me, switch me. Okay. Not ready? Nope. Yep. Okay. 
Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the Hello, I'm Kai Shirley. And I'm Umu Kenute. And, and we are going to read Maven for Atelia Cromwell, 1874 to 1972 by Nikki Finney. Smith College commissioned award-winning poet Nikki Finney to compose a poem in honor of Otelia Cromwell. Finney recited the poem, Maven, during the Otelia Cromwell Day Convocation on November 10th, 2009. The poem is in three parts, and each one begins with a quote from Atelia Cromwell herself. Maven, genus, daughter. When you are a thinking woman, neither violence or sugar plums can muzzle the power of thought. Imagine, hatch, comprehend, apprehend. Know the inside and the out. 
You are just a girl when your mother dies, left to tend the rest of the flock, you, the oldest, the one most like your father, taught to leave no stone unturned, marry thrift and industry while burying your head in the stacks. Sang froid, but never silent. Inquire, picture, ponder, think over, think and think again. Giddy with your own mind, master everything is the family crest. No veil feigning, faking, guise, masquerade or fanfare. There is a right way and a wrong. When you give your hand to the world, your responsibility to have a mind, keep a mind, change a mind, and be the last to die. Genus, scholar. An educated group is a thinking group. Intuit, divine, check and recheck, invent, know the backward and the forward. You care nothing for the popular, even less for the slipshod. Your arms flower with all the leading out books, choosing wisely what and who trains you. Frankness, virtuoso, mastery, crackerjack. Think and think again. You leave college and university, and university exceptionally prepared. You are complex and astute, as calm as a comma. No time for jewelry or parlor bows. There is a golden watch, a signet ring, a Smith College pin, white letters on gold just above the heart. Diligent, proficient, self-possessed, you weigh in with words to state your tolerance to the inefficient. You never back down from what is right. Young Adelaide is your dependable, and the ninth graders, leaning into your instruction, whisper, this must be college. You gray beautifully, but early. Genius, writer. The genius does not write to please. Nor live to marry. Veritas, words pulled through a fine tooth comb, then before sleep pulled through again. You refuse to segregate language from life, read German for sport, and swing golf clubs just to stay in the qui vive. You write of the legality of taxes, pika out democracy, vow and edit for the integral Negro intellectual. Winnow, probe, sift through, quest. Think and think again. Solemnly engaged now to Lucretia and Thomas, you dislike being called doctor and remain forever keen on miss. What the dutiful, trained hand can perfectly stitch delights you. Unconventional and easygoing, your desire never wanes. To be put through the paces, edify, enlighten, to work outward, from simple seam to monogram. We, we herald, herald your, your bright, bright hallmark, hallmark of first, those sprightly high-waisted truths, the soft-spoken whippersnapper, the loping still. Thank you. took away the flowers so that you could see me, <laughs> and the flowers. Hello, I'm Andrea Hairston, and I'm a professor here in the theater department, and I am going to speak woo, on the life and legacy of Otelia Cromwell. In the summer of 1899, in a letter to her father, Otelia Cromwell wrote, did you know that there were short articles about my entering Smith in the New York Herald and Philadelphia Times? It was a quick, offhand comment, but it spoke to a monumental moment for Smith College, for higher education, and for the country. Born under Jim Crow, Dr. Cromwell lived through the civil rights era, passing away in 1972 at the age of 98. 
Despite the enormous challenges facing black women and women of color in any profession, she moved inexorably through her education to become an accomplished and well-respected scholar and educator, as well as an advocate for civil rights and racial and gender equality. Dr. Cromwell's niece, Adelaide Cromwell, also a Smith alumna, described her aunt's understated gravitas. She wasn't confrontational, but she wasn't fearful, and she was gentle in appearance, dignified. When what she said then is as true now, that you must stand up for what you believe in. You must be independent. You must be caring. You must be appreciative and fearless. Dr. Cromwell was born in 1874 into a prominent Washington, D.C. family. Her father, John Cromwell, was a distinguished journalist, scholar, lawyer, and educator. After completing high school, Dr. Cromwell entered a teaching certificate or earned a teaching certificate from the Minor Normal School and taught in the DC public schools for six years while taking courses at Howard University. In 1897, she applied to transfer to Vassar and Smith, but only Smith was pressing enough to accept her. While a student at Smith, Dr. Cromwell was not allowed to live in a campus residence hall, boarding off campus instead. However, in an 1899 letter to her father, she spoke of her experience at Smith and the education she was receiving. At Smith, the members of the faculty show so much human interest in the students. Classwork and, uh, classroom work and a high standard at that is required of us, but our health and comfort is so carefully looked after. When she graduated from Smith, Dr. Cromwell returned to Washington, teaching high school English, German, and Latin. She continued her education, completing her MA in English at Columbia University in 1910, and her doctorate in English at Yale in 1926, the first African-American woman to do so. Dr. Cromwell was a quiet but powerful force. She served as one of the only women on the board of directors of the Encyclopedia of the Negro, working with her colleague W.E.B. Du Bois. She was the author of numerous essays which touted the importance of education as a method of resistance. She was an independent thinker and committed social justice activist. Dr. Cromwell went on to become an English professor at Minor. At her retirement in 1944, the DC Board of Education published a statement notably similar to Dr. Cromwell's early assessment of the faculty at Smith College. The influence she exerted in her position cannot be easily estimated. Encouraging students to pursue graduate work in leading universities, stimulating them to write, she was still never too busy to listen to their problems or to entertain them in small groups in her home. After retiring, Dr. Cromwell began her most ambitious scholarly work, a biography of another pioneering woman, suffragist and abolitionist Lucretia Mott, which was published by Harvard University Press in 1958. In 1950, Dr. Cromwell returned to Smith to receive an honorary Doctors of Laws degree. Otilia Cromwell Day not only celebrates Dr. Cromwell as our first African-American graduate, it celebrates her as the quintessence of a Smith graduate, unapologetically and unceasingly asserting her place in her education, her career, and in the world. Lisa Daniels, a 2016 Smith graduate captured the import of Dr. Cromwell's achievements well. This is not about one culture. This is not about one race. 
This is not about just one person in particular, but you exist here because she was here. We are all part of her legacy in one form or fashion, through race, through class, through culture, through being women in the world, trying to understand how we can be leaders in our lives and in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hairston, for telling the remarkable story of Otelia Cromwell. I have the privilege of acknowledging Adelaide Cromwell and later introducing D.L. Stewart to the community. But first, I just want to share a few thoughts with the Smith community. The last several weeks have been a very difficult time for so many of us. We've seen hate-motivated killings based on race and religion. As you all know, Two black senior citizens were shot and killed in Louisville, Kentucky by a white supremacist. And last Saturday, 11 people were murdered in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania during Shabbat by an anti-Semite. And we've seen partisan politics play out in very disturbing ways with pipe bombs mailed to numerous Democratic members of Congress and their supporters. I know many of us have had strong reactions to the report from the law firm that investigated the July 31st incident on our own campus. I've heard from some people of color that they are concerned that the findings will draw attention away from the broader experience of students, staff, and faculty of color on our campus. Yesterday, there was a meeting of the newly formed Inclusion Council, and we thought about this and talked about this. And I want to share a bit about the discussion that took place at the council yesterday. We began by agreeing the obvious, that Smith needs transformative change, not a quick fix, to realize Smith's commitment to inclusion, diversity, and equity. We know this is what you want as well. And we talked about the fact that there are two conditions that are necessary for transformative change a sense of urgency, which we have, and buy-in from the entire community, which we seek. We want you to know that we realize we don't have all the answers, but we have the will and the heart to work alongside members of this community to find them. I know that we have been here before, and I know that some of you are questioning whether anything will really change this time. But this is an important moment for Smith. It's important that we use this moment to make structural changes so that the experiences of students, staff, and faculty, all students, staff, and faculty, are truly aligned with our values of justice and equity. We have had three Inclusion Council open office hours, and we are learning from those discussions. We've learned that people need different things right now to help them heal which is the focus of today, healing. We know that some of us are in a great deal of pain, and we know that some of us seek to find meaning in community. In addition, you have shared ideas with members of the council to help us move forward. Some of you like the idea of once again offering a class on thinking through race. Smith once offered this class. And the council will talk with the faculty about this. Some of you want more opportunities to share your stories, and the Inclusion Council will begin by offering more opportunities to do so. And importantly, uh, we need a plan. We need a comprehensive plan that's feasible and effective for our actions. The Inclusion Council wants to suspend work and classes for a day sometime this spring so that students, staff, and faculty can build that plan together to promote full inclusion for all. For this day to be successful, we need everybody's voices. One member of the Inclusion Council said, we're looking for some sense of goodness, some sense of hope. 
And I think at the end of our time together, members of the Inclusion Council had found that hope, and we want to share it with you here today. I have just one more thing to share. I'm aware of my privilege as president of Smith College, and I want you to know that I care deeply about this work. As I've written to you, this is the most important work of our time, and I commit to doing my best. Every member of this community has the right to feel a sense of belonging, to feel valued, to feel respected, to feel loved. We are a learning organization. Together, we can learn to make it so. And now I'd like to introduce a good friend of mine, Adelaide Cromwell. At Smith College's and Hunter College's first African-American faculty member, Adelaide has been recognized throughout academia as a groundbreaking scholar and trailblazer. As a sociology professor at Boston University, Adelaide developed the nation's first graduate program in Afro-American studies, one that emphasized connections to the surrounding community. Earlier, she helped establish one of the first African studies programs to focus on Africa as a modern society, becoming an influential voice in recognizing emerging leaders who were bringing change to the continent. In 2005, it was Smith's and my absolute pleasure to award Adelaide an honorary Doctor of Letters degree at commencement. Adelaide, we are honored by your presence and the legacy of the Cromwell name. We understand that on Thanksgiving Day, you will be celebrating a birthday. Adelaide will be 99 years old. Please join me in a round of applause for Adelaide Cromwell. Give away. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here. We're going to see you next year, right? Next year will be a big one. Okay, and now it is my pleasure to introduce the 2018 Otilia Cromwell Day keynote speaker. Dafina Lazarus Stewart, or D.L. Stewart, is a professor in the School of Education at Colorado State University. They are a scholar, educator, and activist focused on the growth and success of minoritized groups in post-secondary education. Over the course of a 17-year faculty career, they have focused most intently on issues of race and ethnicity, sexuality and gender, as well as religion, faith, and spirituality. Dr. Stewart is the author of more than four dozen journal articles and book chapters, and is editor, co-editor, or author of four books covering multicultural student services Gender and Sexual Identity of U.S. College Students, The Historical Experiences of Black Collegians in Northern Liberal Arts Colleges, and Rethinking Student Development Theory Through Critical Perspectives. I'd like to read two excerpts from one of Dr. Stewart's essays that highlight our need not just for diversity, but for equity, inclusion, and justice. Diversity asks, who's in the room? Equity responds, who is trying to get in the room but can't? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? Inclusion asks, has everyone's ideas been heard? Justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority? I can think of no better questions to guide us going forward. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. D. L. Stewart. Well, thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Can you hear me? You can't hear me? Okay. How's this? It's better? Okay. I'm not actually talking to the rest of y'all. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. There we go. Yes. I already like y'all already. I am deeply grateful 
for the opportunity to be here with all of you this afternoon. I'm particularly grateful to President McCartney for your personal invitation to be here with you all today, as well as to the Otelia Cromwell Day Planning Committee, and particularly to Dean Marianne Yoshioka and AVP Sam Messinter for your work to help prepare me for my visit, sharing with me a bit about the powerful and amazing community that is Smith College. I think a very special thanks goes to Kim Alston and particularly to Queen Lanier for your work. Yes, yes. Over the past 18 hours, I have seen Queen do everything from food cleanup and set up to, I think Queen is running the lights as we very, <laughs> as I very well speak. She's waving at me through the door, yes. I want to thank um, our students, um, your students that were with me at dinner last night. Um, truly a wonderful introduction to the power and the amazingness of the Smith student body. Thank you, Black Appella, for leading us in the Black National Anthem. Many thanks also to Kai, who I lost where they were. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So it, it is indeed a pleasure to be here at Smith and with you all on this auspicious occasion, Otelia Cromwell Day, as an out, proud, and unerasable black queer trans person. A black queer trans person born of, through, and into the magic and fierceness of black womanhood, moreover. It is also fitting that I speak here on this day. As mentioned by President McCartney, I have studied and published findings of the experiences of the first black matriculants in the modern era of Northern Pride Liberal Arts Colleges, not unlike Smith, but located a little bit further west than we are here. Not unlike Dr. Otelia Cromwell at the turn of the 20th century, these students attended college during another time when black humanity was not only doubted, but actively discarded throughout the country, not just in the South. Nevertheless, they dared to believe that they could influence the attitudes of their white classmates and faculty, that they would convince their classmates and faculty of black humanity and possibility, and that they would prepare themselves to live in a truly integrated multiracial society, like Dr. Otelia Cromwell and her niece, Dr. Adelaide Cromwell, who I neglected to mention earlier. Thank you so much for fellowshipping with me over lunch. But like these two, um, groundbreakers, these students not only broke barriers, not only realizing, not always realizing that this is what they were doing. In many ways, Dr. Cromwell and those individuals in my study reflected the theme of my talk today. One moment. <laughs> that theme today is re- living hope, okay? Those of you who have seen the announcements for this talk know that I put a set of parentheses around the re in reliving. And some of you may be wondering what that's all about. Why couldn't I just say reliving for crying out loud, right? But by using the parentheses, I endeavor to accomplish four things. First is to recognize critical hope as a living entity. Okay? And like anything that lives, it cannot, it cannot sustain itself by itself. I think of it like a plant. Word of caution, I am not a successful gardener, necessarily. <laughs> I have managed to successfully keep alive a philodendron 
through a pot transplant, okay, and uh, a year, and uh, going on a year and a half now of the Colorado weather system. So I try to learn from my mistakes, though, okay? I, meanwhile, I have killed a cactus, so I, you know. <laughs> but this is what I've learned about plants. They must be watered, put into the dirt and given room to grow, and be able to draw light. I think likewise for hope, because without these elements, hope dies, and we'll consider this more as we move forward. Second, I want to point to the reality that within this community and others across the world, there are people who are engaged in the practice of living hope, and there I'm using living as a verb. In other words, they are actively practicing the kind of critical hope that I want to speak about today. Despite constant attacks, hope never really disappears. Third, and building from that, the parentheses is meant to signify that hope is indeed a practice that must be relived continuously. Our hope is constantly under assault by institutionalized and structural aggression so normalized that pointing them out is considered offensive by some. This is another theme that we'll explore more today. Fourth, putting the re in parentheses represents that sometimes hope becomes hard to live into and it seems that hope itself has died. Those normalized aggressions may cause us to leave our hope behind. There are times when we must therefore reclaim a critical hope, rescuing it from the clutches of a despair that settles into acquiescence. Many critical theorists and activists have discussed hope in this kind of way, including Baro Freire, Grace Lee Boggs, Cornel West, and others. Their writings have informed and directed my discussion today. Moreover, I do not speak as one removed from this topic. I don't come to you as some kind of expert or as one who has all of the answers. Rather, I stand before you this afternoon as a co-laborer in the struggle to, forgive me, as Jesse Jackson said during his presidential run in 1980, keep hope alive. Only some of you that are old enough really get why that's kind of funny. <laughs> but to live into hope, to practice it, and to hold on to it for dear life, right? For my life, for our lives, the life of my communities, our communities. So I invite us today to reflect on critical hope, its life, its practice, its practicing, and its reclamation. So hang with me as I go through those four pieces, all right? Okay, there we go. Don't lose it now. <laughs> Let's talk about the life of critical hope. As I mentioned earlier, I see and understand hope as a living entity. Hope existed before time was a thing to be counted out and counted down. I believe before time was made to be a thing, spent like ore, hope was. Hope manifested itself in the explosion of stardust and rock, determined to be life, even a life, moreover a multitude of lives. To sustain itself, hope brought into being the elements needed to sustain it, light, dirt, water. The elements needed to sustain all life. So let's look at those three elements a little more closely. Light. Hope does not grow in cold isolation, in the dank chill that shrinks us down to a ball under the covers at night. Hope grows in light, in the bright warmth that stretches, that helps us stretch out beyond ourselves. Light that invites nourishment through others and reminds us that we cannot grow on our own. It needs dirt. Hope needs roots, something to hold on to. But we've been taught to clean ourselves from dirt. We are told, you smell like outside. Right? Dirt soils the things we use to cover ourselves. It leaves things impure. Dirt isn't 
pretty, it feels grimy in our hands and falls like a sieve through our fingers until it is packed down into a mound to surround a seed. The grime, the impurity does not strangle, it is not suffocating. Dirt is merely the womb for the seed that already has all it needs to be, itself within itself. Hope is like that living thing that grows from nothing that looks like hope, but nevertheless is already what we cannot see. We have no need of hope when there is no dirt to push through. Hope does not grow held in one's hand, clenched in our fist. Hope grows when it is allowed to fall into the dirt, into the muck, into the mire, into the soil, and the soiling from which we try to become clean. And I think that is the irony of hope. Water, or as I actually usually say, water, because I'm originally from New York, so. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> water may be the simplest, most obvious element. None of us can live without it, though most of us don't drink enough of it, right? Let's be honest. Without water, we see crises of lives and hope. This, the desertification of the ground that is needed for the seed. In Colorado, where I now live, a scholar has created a new word for the water deprivation that the state is experiencing. She's called it aridification. The climate is not merely arid, but is being subjected to the active process of being made drier and drier. The withering of the ground. As Langston Hughes has observed, a raisin left out in the sun dries up. Sunlight without water withers rather than sustains life. It's water, that thing that helps us flush out the toxins that seep into us from a world polluted, that is the bond that makes the light and the dirt work together to keep hope a living thing. Let's talk about the practice of critical hope for a moment, or living out hope. Practitioners of critical hope have, have always been with us. They are among the indigenous people of Turtle Island, the forced extradition of whom from these lands made colleges and universities, like and including Smith, possible. Peoples who refuse to die, to be made extinct, to be just historical memory. Peoples who continue to live in defiance of infrastructural attempts to contaminate the water and the land and cultural attempts to water down indigeneity from its grounding in tribe, community, to be merely a thing of ancestral blood quantum. Uh-huh, I said it. Practitioners of critical hope survived the forced migration across the Eastern Ocean, nearly 300 years of back-breaking labor, the whip and the chain, the rape and the ravishing, the nooses and dismemberments of policing forces. These practitioners produced a people who continue to dare to live, to reflect what Lucius, the Roman senator, not the televised music mogul, Lucius Aeneas Seneca is quoted to have said at the beginning of the current millennia, sometimes even to live is an act of courage. Not only an act of courage, but an act of critical hope, the stubborn belief that another world is not only possible, but will be, and that we can make it so. These and many other practitioners of critical hope did not practice their hope in isolation, but rather in and through community with others. They saw each other survive and determined that together they would not only survive, but thrive. In each other's eyes, they saw their own humanity and made a pact to remember that they were human, that they were the Imago Dei that Atman and Brahman flowed through them and out into the world. Practitioners of critical hope connect themselves to ancestral resistance and remembrance and honor of the community that had gone on before, who also underwent trauma, were washed in toxins, and yet survived. As a black, queer, trans person, I practice critical hope because Gladys Alberta Bentley did. Hey, 
because Marsha P. Johnson did, because Miss Major Griffin Gracie did, because C.C. McDonald and Tourmaline Gossett do, because I am born of a critical hope who saw that I would be before I was and who made another world possible into which I could be born, who passed on the tools of resistance. This practicing of critical hope though, Critical hope is practiced. It is relived day after day after day in both small and grand acts of resistance and defiance. And I've spoken about these in a sense already, but suffer me to say a little bit more about them here. Settler colonialism and anti-blackness power the engine that runs the United States. Right? <laughs> This is an uncomfortable truth, but it's one that needs to be clearly and specifically enunciated. Settler colonialism and anti-blackness show up on the macro level in the forced removal, in privatizing the land, in policies of impoverishment, in mass incarceration, and in the legitimation of the carceral state violence. However, settler colonialism and anti-blackness also appear in everyday life and interactions. We can see settler colonialism at work and how the land and the buildings erected upon that land are made accessible to some but inaccessible to others. And I'm using accessibility there in multiple ways. We see it in the socialization of individuals into beliefs and practices that enable the restriction of land use to only those who are capable of proving their institutionalized authority to be there. And then the police are called to guard access to that property and to the land. It is only some people who are made to not belong in certain spaces, who are subjected to suspicion, who are made to give account of themselves. And I do not believe that this being made not to belong is a product of individualized bias that can be captured in a report or reconciled through training. No, the reality that certain people are made to not belong in certain spaces is a product of the systematic socialization of individuals into settler colonialism and anti-blackness. Individual acts are the result of systems and processes and structures. They cannot be separated from them. So his successful socialization into the paradigms of settler colonialism and anti-blackness is what made it reasonable for George Zimmerman to chase down and then murder Trayvon Martin in the street. It was the successful socialization of a white homeowner in Dearborn, Michigan that enabled him to murder Renisha McBride at his front door, a black woman seeking help after a car accident. It was a successful socialization of a white manager in Philadelphia that caused her to call the police on two black men waiting for a work colleague at their local Starbucks. It was the successful socialization of Amber Geiger, a Dallas police officer, that enabled her to fire upon Botham Jean multiple times, killing him in his own apartment. It was the successful socialization of individuals and these incidents that are widely spread are mostly white, that produced police calls on an enterprising black child who was at work cutting lawns, on black people at a cookout, on a black child selling lemonade, on a black man who was a home inspector doing his job, on a black state representative canvassing in a neighborhood in her own district. It was the successful socialization of a white parent on a college tour at Colorado State University that prompted her to call campus police on two young indigenous men on the same tour for being too quiet, for not having on the clothing she deemed appropriate, for uncomfortable giggling instead of answering questions from a stranger who was not a college representative. 
It was the successful socialization of a white college student at Yale that prompted her to call the police on a black woman who had fallen asleep in the common areas of her residence hall. We have all been rained on, though. Each one of us, including those of us with minoritized identities, is capable of adopting settler colonial and anti-black attitudes and behaviors. Each one of us, at some point in our lives, probably has. Our collective socialization as members of the larger populace of this country is reinforced by institutional policies, procedures, and norms, and it's perhaps a result of those systemic and institutional structures that made July 31st happen here. not about individual people and personal failings. That's not where the focus goes. Successful socialization marks territory for some but not others. It marks black, indigenous, and other people of color as automatically suspicious when they enter territory where they are unknown to belong. It's a matter of successful socialization and institutional reinforcement, not implicit bias, that creates and recreates these instances that have become too numerous to count. It is very easy as we think about, um, as what has been mentioned several times already this afternoon, in, within the last week, right, we've had multiple macro examples of terroristic violence. It is easy and is often the easy path that is taken to say that it's the people, those individuals are somehow flawed, right? That then go to um, oppress, target, and stigmatize further people with mental illness, with psychiatric disabilities as somehow the root of these issues. And as someone with a psychiatric disability, I take particular offense to that. But that happens because we don't, as a society, generally want to actually look at what's at the root, what's been growing underground and out in the open as the reason, as the impetus, as the lightning rod that has sparked all of these things. And if it's true on the macro level, why would it not also be true in the daily acts of microaggressions that happen every day? Not just on our campuses, but as we're walking down the street, as we're driving our car, as we're hanging out with friends in a backyard. We cannot train away how we have been socialized. On the contrary, each of us and collectively must embark on a process of unlearning and new learning, a re-socialization based on a different set of paradigms. And still not only that, our institutions must deeply examine how policies, practices, and procedures reinforce social norms of settler colonialism and anti-blackness. As Audre Lorde noted in her essay, The Uses of Anger, in the early 1980s, anger is an appropriate response to racism. <laughs> Let me put a fine point on it. Racism and colonialism do not begin with individual acts but rather our institutional, structural, and societal systems designed to support and engender individual acts and institutional policies and practices. What else is a more appropriate response to the dehumanizing paradigms of settler colonialism and anti-blackness than anger? To quote from James Baldwin, to be black and relatively conscious in this nation is to be angry all the time. 
But to me and those others who are angry at the daily assaults of a racist, anti-black, and settler colonial society, I offer Audre Lorde's words later in that same essay, everything can be used except what is wasteful. You will need to remember this when you are accused of destruction. Lord goes on to articulate that anger is loaded with information and energy that is potentially useful to cause systemic change. A change she describes as a basic and radical alteration in those assumptions underlining our lives. Right? Notice that's the change. A basic and radical alteration in those assumptions underlining our lives. And so we cannot be afraid of anger, she says. Through it, we can reach a total and complete intolerance of anti-blackness and settler colonialism and the motivation to disrupt the socialization that produces constant and consistent manifestations of these dehumanizing paradigms. Marianne, I don't think I'm gonna make 205. <laughs> I'm gonna get as close as I can though, I promise. Through anger, a collective anger, we can reclaim hope in our communities through lassoing that anger, okay? So let's talk about that reclamation of critical hope. In my research, I heard the story of a woman who was part of the second cohort of black students to desegregate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay, people always talk about the Little Rock Nine when they forget that there had to be other Little Rock sixes and fives and fours and tens that also had to come after them. It wasn't just done in one year. Okay, the process of change of desegregation doesn't happen in one year. Okay. So she was part of the second cohort. After graduating from Central High School, she then went on to Earlham College in Indiana, a state commonly known by black people at the time as Up South, all right, for the pervasiveness of open racism and racial terror across the state during this time. By the time she went to Central High, though, the governor in Arkansas had seen fit to make the desegregation of extracurricular activities in schools illegal. Okay, you might force us to integrate our classrooms, but you're not gonna make us integrate what happens after school, okay? So this girl, and she was a girl at the time, this girl who had been actively involved in clubs and student government and other activities in middle school in her black segregated middle schools was restricted to classroom studies alone during high school. Like the first cohort of nine, she experienced also daily indignities and microaggressions. So for instance, at school, at Central High, where she went every day, five days a week, nine months out of the school year for three years, no one except two teachers talked to her. No one except two of her teachers spoke a word to this child for three years, three years. When I heard this, I, I was just dumbfounded as many of you probably are right now. When I asked her then after hearing this, why, why, why did you bother to consider even attending a predominantly white college after experiencing all of that? She simply told me that she believed what she had been told about Earlham and the people there, that she would have a different experience. Somehow, she managed to refuse to fall into despair. She believed that the wounds she had suffered would heal in community with others. She was determined 
to not allow despair to steal hope from her. Such a stance can be hard to maintain. I mean, after all, how many extrajudicial extra murders by the state can one take? How many instances of black, indigenous, and other peoples being subjected to police surveillance, interrogation, and possible violence can one endure? How many acts of hate? How many pipe bombs? How many school shootings? How many churches and synagogues under attack? How many mosques burned down can we take? before we believe that this is all that there ever can be. Some recommend taking social media sabbaticals. <laughs> I didn't actually mean to say it like that. I'm not gonna apologize for it though. <laughs> And although that can be a good and important strategy at time for one's own mental health to take a break from it all, it's not necessarily a strategy that leads to reclaiming hope. <laughs> you still know it's happening. <laughs> okay. So what does reclaiming hope look like? All right. Again, Audre Lorde provides us a model in her poem, A Litany for Survival. Please suffer me to, to pull some excerpts from it here today. She's speaking to those and for those who live at the shoreline standing upon the constant edges of decision. And I think that in this society, yea, even here at Smith, we are at a moment of decision, at the edge of decision. So I think this is appropriate for you all here now. She's speaking also to those who are seeking a now that can breed futures, like bread in our children's mouths, so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. The work that is happening here at Smith in our larger society cannot just be for our own present time here. Institutional transformation and institutional change takes a generation. And I don't mean a generation of student body turnover, okay? And so the work has to foresee the participation and the presence and the engagement and the possibility of future others of you. As students, as faculty, as administrators, as staff. So that their dreams will not reflect the possible death of yours. She goes on to enunciate the ways that hope can falter in the midst of these constant assaults on humanity and dignity that invoke and that evoke mistrust and worriness a wariness, right? So she says, and when the sun rises, we are afraid. It might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are Alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. She doesn't end there. She ends with a decision that is instructive for this present moment. So it is better to speak, remembering that we were never meant to survive. Reclaiming hope means to reclaim our voices, our right to speak out and speak from anger at injustice. It also means to believe, as my participant model, that another world is possible and that we can be part of the change that brings it about. All this raises three critical questions for the community here at Smith College. 
or I should say sets of questions. If I've been told that I'm really good at asking questions, I'm very not very good at giving answers. My students get frustrated by that because I refuse to give them answers. And so I have questions, set three sets of questions for us to consider today. Those questions, the lead parts of them, who is our community, who is in our community, what does resistance look like in community, and how do we heal as a community? So let me go through those real quick as I am way over um, the end of my time. Who is our community or who is in our community? Who do you think of when you speak of the Smith community, of Smithies? Is it just faculty, administrators, students? An alumni, an alumni. Where do facilities and dining hall staff fit in? Where does the local community of Northampton fit in? Who is encouraged to take part in college events? Who is thought of when major campus-wide events are planned? Are directors and vice presidents making it possible for all staff to participate? Are faculty making it possible for students to come into the space? Who is given access to community? Who is made a legitimate participant? Who gets to learn and grow in community? Who is made a legitimate participant? Right? Does your community have upper house and lower house contingents? Is it a Downton Abbey, right? <laughs> I dare say that should it, such a climate exist, it is not a community you have but a hierarchy. <laughs> Critical hope requires a radically democratic community, okay? about not just being at the table. Thank you, President McCartney, for bringing in pieces of that essay. It is by far the most thing I've read that has been, thing I've written that's been read the most often. And, and I've determined that I, in, I must need to write more of that if I want stuff to be actually read. So um, <laughs> it's not just who's at the table but the consideration of voices at risk of not being heard. So it can't just be we do these things for all, but that we think about who are the most vulnerable. I'm not talking about evoking some kind of Olympics oppression, but rather the consideration of the reality that there are some members of this community that are at greater risk than others. Okay. I gotta keep going, y'all stop that. All right, what does resistance look like in community, right? So from where does your resistance arise? How are you using anger as productive energy, not just to burn up the dross, but to purify the gold? To whom or to what is your anger directed? Are you angry only with people? Is there just one individual you're targeting with your anger or set of individuals? Do you see the systems, the institutional practices and policies which produce the conditions that inspire your anger? Do, you de do your demands actually target institutional transformation or just merely reform? Who do you seek to include in your resistance? Do you accept the collaboration and accompliceship of others who may not be directly impacted, but who recognize the injustice and the collusion of systems and those who enforce and maintain them? How does love anchor your resistance? As James Baldwin once responded to a journalist, I'm on the last page. As James Baldwin responded, I love America more than any other country in this world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. But are you able to say, I love Smith College more than any other college in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize alma mater perpetually? Critical hope requires resistance, and if that resistance is not steeped in love, it will be more destructive than reconstructive.
It's about resisting systems and structures, not people for their individual acts of collusion that are born of the same rain that has gotten us all wet. How do we heal as a community? Do you fear anger, resistance, and criticism? Can you handle the dirtiness, the grime, and the soiling of anger, resistance, and criticism? How can you get comfortable with anger and even invite it as an appropriate response to settler colonialism and racism? It's got to extend throughout the college, the entire community. Are you a silent bystander? Or are you an active accomplice to the work of resistance, of purifying, refining, and transforming? In order for hope to grow, in order to heal, everybody has to be in it. Everybody's hands must get dirty. Do you know what healing looks like, feels like, sounds like? In other words, will you know when you are healed? When you are on the path toward healing, will you even recognize it? Healing is not the absence of criticism or resistance or even necessarily the absence of anger. Being angry reflects a determination that you believe the community can be better, right? I hope so. I've said um, to others before, if I didn't care about you, I wouldn't be angry right now. I would just ignore you. Right? It's the same thing. Anger happens because we believe the spaces that you, we are in, our communities can be better. Otherwise, we would just ignore them and move on about our business. Okay? Healing is the process of letting go of despair, of letting go of futility, of letting go of nihilism. Healing is the restoration of trust, the conviction that you are not wished harm, that you are not held under suspicion, that there are structures of accountability and desire to be held accountable. Critical hope requires such healing. We can't just stew in our woundedness if we intend to heal. Community is that engine for both resistance and healing. Without community, resistance becomes isolated and embittered. Without community, healing is shallow and performative rather than lived. Small acts can change the world, yes. However, those small acts must be interconnected and accountable to a community-defined set of values and goals. Resistance and healing, in order to be effective, must be processes and practices rooted in the principles of radical democracy where everybody is not just at a table but is constructing the table together. So Smith, I leave you with this final set of questions. Who's busy helping to build the table? Where is that table being built? And what are you hoping for this community? It's how we answer these questions that will get us to community and healing through resistance, okay? As the theme for today states. Thank you. I was warned it was hot in this building. They did not lie. <laughs> Perfect timing. We have uh, a little time left for 
questions, and we have microphones here, and I know we have some staff members coming to help with the mics. We would just like to ask that we give preference, that preference is given to the questions for those in the Smith the Smith student body um, and faculty and others who are here from the Smith, from Smith, and that we all are just mindful that we always make room for the voices and questions for folks um, from underrepresented groups. So if you have a question, come on up to the front. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, the dirt. Yeah. So, question about the dirt. Yes. Uh -huh. um, especially in the context of a day like Otelia Cromwell Day. Um, so at Smith, we always learn about Otelia Cromwell Day as being about the legacy of Otelia Cromwell, but this day came about because in 1989, a series of hate notes were sent to all of the black students living in Chapin House, um, in addition to hate notes that were sent to faculty and staff. And out of student protest and coming to the table with people in the administration who were willing, like this day came to be. And like through that dirt, we were able to like grow this plant called Tillery Cromwell Day. So my question to you is like, how do we convince institutions like Smith that we like need the dirt to grow things and not just to, like throw back in their faces? Like how do we convince them that we need to know about 1989 to really understand this day? So do you know what happens when, or I'll, I'll ask, ask the question this way. What happens when you take flowers out of the ground for a bouquet? They die. Eventually the flowers die, right? Because they come, become disconnected from the dirt, right? They're not rooted in a thing. And I think it's, it's, and it's hard, right? This, this, is, this is a thing that is, is, not, uh, is not unique to this place. We do this as a country. We are uncomfortable with our dirt, right? We are uncomfortable with our dirt. Um, we think about the uh, establishment of Martin Luther King Day as a federal holiday, right? Um, there's lots of celebrations of his dream and, um, you know, his oratory and whatnot. And yet, right, we rarely talk about why he had to have a dream in the first place, right? <laughs> we don't really talk about um, the assassination. We don't talk about the ongoing acts of racism throughout the country that provoked the need to try to recognize in some way to pull us back. And so, and when that happens, things get distorted. Legacies can be distorted, right? It's important to remember, it was named here this afternoon. It was important, it's important to remember that Otelia, when she was a student here, could not live on campus, right? Many of the, um, the black women in my study, as I looked at these 13 institutions, almost had sort of the flip, some of the flip experience in a way in that they could not live, these were institutions that, that were big on sororities and, and sort of fraternities and, and social society life, right? And almost from, from first year, um, in the middle of the first year, you were expected as a student, whether regardless of gender, you were expected to end up joining one of these societies or you know, fraternities, sororities. But those houses, let alone the chapters themselves, membership requirements in the houses were racially exclusive, right? Were segregated. And so you saw, um, or I saw, black women who had to live in the common dorm, right? Or residence hall the entirety of their four years, right? It became the place where people who couldn't live anywhere else had to live, right? And it's out of those things Right, that resistance forms. And I, you know, you, your, your question, Kai, is how, how can you convince? 
I think it's having, I don't, I don't know how you convince people of things. I do know that if you stop talking, the convincing will never happen. I do know that if people are not listening, the convincing will never happen, right? It requires both sides, talking and listening. We've got to steep our celebrations in the recognition of why we need to celebrate a thing, a person, an event, right? All of it, because the dirt is necessary, right? The dirt's necessary. You wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here. Many of our marginalized, minoritized student communities here at Smith wouldn't be here without some dirt. The dirt of resistance, the soil of oppression produces change, can produce, you know, it produces the anger that produces the change, right? And so, you know, I, I would just encourage, you know, I'm, I'm you know, can't say I'm single-handedly going to convince everybody, anybody of anything. You know, I'm, I'm still working on that with my son. <laughs> He's 19. He's like y'all's age. How many of y'all can be easily convinced of anything, right? <laughs> Particularly by a parent. Anyway, <laughs> so, but it's, it's if, if I can say anything to the community and the leadership that are gathered here, it's that I would encourage you to not be afraid to bring out the dirt to not be afraid to air the dirty laundry, okay? So that the why of the day becomes centered. So that that might be instructive and an impetus to bring more people so that you have to have a bigger space because more people want to come and want to be a part of it, right? I think that's, I would encourage you to consider doing that as you plan for next year to make it central. Not because that's gonna detract from anything that Otelia Cromwell achieved here and after Smith, but to ground those achievements, right? and why they are so special, why the community here is how it is, why it is important that black students, indigenous students, and other people of color continue to be here at Smith and to survive and not just survive but thrive, right? So I, I offer that encouragement and, and perhaps that will help. You're welcome, Kai. Yes. Um, thank you again to Professor Stewart for an amazing address. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to welcome back uh, Black Appella to the stage and just to let you know that they came in, Black Appella came in existence in the fall of 2016 out of the pain and trauma of black students grappling with the current state of anti-blackness in the country. Their mission is first, to empower black students through song, and secondly, to use their collective voices to engage the larger community in the fight for black life. And they add, hashtag, black lives matter always. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. That was lovely. And that concludes our program for this plenary. Thank you to President McCartney, to Professor Stewart, and for all of you. Just to remind you, we have a wonderful roster of workshops for learning and for arts, and that the Poetry, through, uh, Poetry for Healing and Resistance workshop is actually in the Campus Center, room 205 not 103 and 104 if you can make the correction in your programs. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>